My name is Courtney Waring. I'm the Director of Education at the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art. Thank you for joining us for our program, Leonard S. Marcus on Censorship. Before we begin, I just have a couple of notes to share. We're so thankful for the Carl's members, business members, donors, your contributions make our work possible. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member at the Carl, just visit our website, carlmuseum.org. We'd also like to thank the Patricia Morrison McDonald Endowment Fund for supporting our education programming and the Massachusetts Cultural Council for their operational support. And we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to use the chat button anytime during the program to say hi, your name, where you're coming and connecting from. Um, we just love to hear from everyone. And please use the Q&A button as well. If you have any questions during the program, we're going to have dedicated time at the end to ask Leonard and Leslie questions. Tonight's program is being recorded. So if you miss any portion or would like to share with a friend, we should have a recording of this on the Carl's YouTube page sometime early next week. And in the off chance that we experience any technical difficulties and get cut off, thank you in advance for your patience. Um, we'll try to get back online as soon as possible. And you can use the link shared in your Eventbrite reminder to reconnect with us. And now on to our program. Leonard Marcus is an authority on children's books and the people who create them, having authored more than 25 biographies, histories, interview collections, and inside looks at the making of children's literature's classics. He's a founding trustee of the Carl and teaches at NYU in the School of Visual Arts and speaks to audiences, not only just throughout the US, but around the world. And his new book, You Can't Say That, Leonard interviews authors about what it's like to have work banned or challenged in America today. And joining Leonard is Leslie Newman, the award-winning author of over 75 books for readers of all ages. Leslie wrote Heather Has Two Mommies, the first children's book to portray lesbian families in a positive way, and has followed up this pioneering work with several more children's books on lesbian and gay families. In addition to being an author, Leslie is a popular guest lecturer, having spoken on college campuses across the country. Currently, she's faculty mentor at Spalding University's School of Creative and Professional Writing. Welcome, Leonard and Leslie. Well, thank you, um, Courtney, very much. Um, and thanks to everyone at the museum. And thank you, Leslie, for being here with me. Um, it's an honor. Yeah. Well, we, we, I got a good chance to talk with you when I was working on, on my book. And so we're gonna, in some ways, revisit some of the questions that we talked about then and see what, where we come to and understanding a little bit more about what censorship is all about. Uh, I'll just say that um, I first um, began thinking about making a book on the subject of censorship in children's literature um, about six years ago when there were two conferences on the subject um, one at UC um, Fresno in California, the other at the Bank Street College of Education um, in New York City. And I was brought in as the history guy, you know, the person who could talk about what had happened over the last couple of hundred years in the way of um, banning and challenging of books. Um, and then the other speakers were all um, writers and illustrators of our time who um, had had the experience themselves of having books um, get into that sort of a difficulty or trouble, Leslie being one of them. And I think we must have began talking at one of those conferences and that led to, to our doing the interview together, but certainly we've gotten to know each other over the last several years. Maybe. I was in Fresno, so I think that's where uh, it all began. Yeah, yeah. You don't um, forget Fresno once you've been there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that I had noticed looking um, at the past was how, even though um, censorship in America rarely comes from the central government in Washington. It's usually more local or regional. And that's in contrast to the way it happens in a lot of other countries, everywhere from ancient Rome to contemporary China uh, and many other examples that, that I could name. Um, despite the fact that that isn't, isn't how it happens in the US, it does seem that um, the government in Washington sets a tone that reverberates through the country and at certain times in history. And so that's a kind of um, atmosphere in which censorship can, can thrive. And that was certainly true in the 1980s um, during the Reagan years. And 
Um, and it was obviously going to be true um, starting in 2016 uh, when I was beginning to work on this book. So that's just his background for, for what drew me into the subject. And I, I would say that I was so moved by um, the writers um, and illustrators who spoke about their experiences. Um, and it, it just felt like something that urgently needed to be talked about. Leonard, I'm just going to quickly interject. We've had a couple. Uh, thanks, everyone, for sharing in the chat where you're coming from. I think um, your sound is a little low. I don't know if you want to just check if you could bring it up a higher or maybe something's covering your your mic. Um, is this better? It sounds the same. All right. Let me see if I can I'll go to preferences. Um, also, is sometimes if you just physically move closer to the mic, that can help. Um, uh, all right, I'll do that. I, I'm not having any luck in making it better, I don't think. Can, can you hear me at all better now? I can hear you better when you're closer. You might just need to speak up a little bit louder. All right, okay, how's that? Oh, yeah, that's great. Oh, all right, okay, good, problem <laughs> solved. Yeah, um, that's why I didn't become an actor. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so just to get started, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, define a few of the, the terms that people always use when they talk about this subject. And so, Leslie, would you have a take a go at saying what it means for a book to be challenged, what it means for a book to be banned, and what we mean by censorship? So a lot of people talk to me and say, oh, your book has been banned. But what they really mean is that my book has been challenged. So challenge is when somebody comes usually into a library and says, we don't think this book, whatever book, should be in the library. And usually the librarian has a form that they fill out. And then there are meetings and a decision is made. And then if the book is banned, that means the decision was to little ban it from the library, take it out of the library. And then censorship, you know, has a lot of different meanings. There's self-censorship, for example, when a writer wants to write something but decides for whatever reason uh, that's not a good idea, or um, librarians deciding not to carry a particular book in their library, then there's also gray censorship. So, you know, it's, it's more complex than it, it first seems. Yeah, and I mean, interestingly, the word um, censor and censorship goes back to ancient Rome, and the the censors who worked in the government had two related job jobs that were related in the minds of the people who um, set up the system. One was for them to take the census, so that's why that word sounds so much like censorship. It was counting heads and keeping track of who who was there, and then the second part was overseeing the morals of those people. So it was like counting them and then watching over them. <laughs> so that's that's what we have um, going on even today. But in the example that you gave, um, it shows you how it works on a local level. So these challenges are happening all over the country um, in localities and hundreds every year, it turns out. Um, I just so, want to say, uh, this is why it's important to, to really participate, uh, run for school boards, run for library boards, you know, to really be involved on the local level. That's right. Yeah. And in a minute, I want to sort of look at the, the impact, you know, that that can have on a community. But I thought we should maybe first hear a little bit about um, how you became a writer and in particular, how you became the, the author of Heather Has Two Mommies. Sure. So um, I began as a poet. Poetry is still my first love. And I just thought I would always be a poet, uh, writing poetry for adults and nothing else. And then the story has become very famous. Uh, I was walking down the street in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, where I lived, and a lesbian mom came up to me and said, I don't have a book I could read to a daughter that chose a family like mine. Somebody should write one. And by somebody, she meant me. And so I took this request very seriously. I went to the library and I took out armloads of picture books, mistakenly thinking, well, there's not a lot of words. How hard can this be? I'm a poet. I should know better. Um, it's very challenging form and very satisfying form to write. Um, the book, I could not find a publisher anywhere. Uh, I sent it to children's book publishers who said, you know, we know nothing about the lesbian market. I sent it to lesbian publishers who said, we know nothing about the children's book market. 
And then just when it seemed about hopeless, I thought about my grandmother uh, who said to me, just because you say no to me, you think I'm finished. And I decided that I would publish the book uh, on my own, but I didn't do it on my own own. Um, a friend and I, my friend Sylvia Gover, who had a desktop publishing business at the time, and I decided to co-publish the book. And we literally licked envelopes. This is way before Kickstarter and sent out fundraising letters and raised $4,000. And we found an illustrator and a printer and then heather came into being yeah right and then all kinds of things happened which brought it from a local audience to a really an international audience and we'll maybe get to those in a minute too i also i, I think i want people to know that you knew alan ginsburg and that you were his assistant for a while during your student years and he had something really wonderful uh, to say about what it takes to be a writer and I wondered if you would just tell that for everyone. To, sure. So I really loved hearing that when you said it in, in, in our interview. So Alan was my mentor, and I think uh, he would be very proud to, you know, he, his book, Howl, of course, went on trial, and, and he won the right for that book to remain in print. But uh, when he was my mentor, he said to me that writing is 33% inspiration, 33% respiration, and 33% perspiration. And I said, okay, Alan, um, that's adds up to 99%. What's the other 1%? And he said, magic. And I always loved that. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. So I'd like to dispel a myth. Um, and, you know, in Mark Twain's um, Ventures of Huckleberry Finn was famously banned at the library in Concord, Massachusetts. First, the book was put on the shelves there. And then the, the uh, trustees of the library met and decided that it was um, inappropriate, um, that it was kind of like a trashy book, it's basically what they said. Um, and uh, Mark Twain's response to that uh, news was, oh, well, that'll be good for another 25,000 in sales. So he made it out to sound like it was a good thing uh, for an author. I think many people know that story and they think, well, if that's the case, if, um, if banning or, or challenging a book, making it controversial, controversial in that way, um, leads to sales and to a wider availability of the book, what is there to complain about? So, um, so what I'd like to ask you to say is, what are the other consequences of a book being challenged or banned? And who, who gets affected by that? Yeah, so many people said a version of that to me. Oh, I wish my book would get challenged. You know, you must be making hand over fist or whatever. But really, there are huge consequences. Um, and the, the people who get hurt the most, I really believe, are the children. Because uh, the children either don't get to read the books that they need to get to read, or the children who are very smart get this message that, wow, this book about a family that has a kid and two moms, people, you know, are mad about this book. So there must be something wrong with that family and there must be something wrong with my family. And, you know, that's a tragic message to send to a child. Yeah, and then, I mean, if you think of this, this happening in a community, you can begin to imagine um, you know, how people take sides, they, they, you know, co-workers, teachers, let's say, or librarians meet at the water cooler and they're on opposite sides of the debate and they begin to eye each other with suspicion and maybe hatred. And, and it seems like um, many communities have been torn asunder uh, by these challenges. Um, even if the end result is that that particular book stays on the shelf when it's all said and done. You've, you've had experiences of that kind uh, in relation to Heather, haven't you? Absolutely. So, for example, in Wichita Falls, uh, Texas, there was a, a huge um, controversy over Heather Has Two Mommies. There was a man who, he was a preacher, and he would take, uh, he actually took Heather Has Two Mommies and its companion, Daddy's roommate, out of the library and used it in his Sunday sermon and riled up his congregation. And by the way, he was also running for public office, so he used this as his platform. He refused to return the books. Instead, he offered the monetary value of the books to the librarian, who of course refused that. Um, and she actually quoted uh, the Bible back to him, Thou shalt not steal. Uh, but he 
you know, he thought this was doing civil disobedience. It wasn't stealing, but the whole community was in an uproar. There were letters to the paper. There were actual prayer circles being held in the public library, which of course um, there is such a thing as separation of church and state. So those people were asked to leave the library and they had to stand a certain amount of feet away from the library. City council was divided. I mean, it, it was just, it was like a riot. It was very upsetting. Yeah. One of the aspects of that um, incident was that for a while, um, as I understand it, Heather was, even though it was published as a children's book, was put in a separate part of the library, um, so, essentially segregated from the other children's books. Could you talk about that in particular, but also what it, what implications there are uh, in, you know, in real terms for a ch young reader, a child, in, ha in having, say, to ask special permission to read a book? So two things happened, actually, and I can't remember which came first, but one thing that happened was that they wanted the books to be in the adult section of the library, which clearly they are children's books. And I think maybe when that didn't work, they also wanted to have a special um, adult only checkout section. And the only two books in the entire library would have been Heather Has Two Mommies and Daddy's Roommate. Now, I can think of a lot of other books that I would prefer maybe five-year-olds couldn't read, uh, shouldn't read because it's not, they're not age appropriate and, you know, not books like Heather Has Two Mommies and Daddy's Roommate. But, you know, there's a sense of shame. Like, I, I have to ask the librarian for this book, you know, and then I have to, like, take it home, like, you know, in a brown paper bag so nobody sees that I'm reading it. I mean, it's just awful to do that to a kid. Yeah, you know, Roby Harris, um, nonfiction writer, who I also interviewed for this book, um, is the author of um, It's Perfectly Normal, a book about um, human sexuality meant for middle grade children, one of the most uh, frequently challenged books in, in recent history, um, told a story about a girl who went to the library with her mother, um, and mother said, you know, look around and borrow whatever book interests you. So she found it's perfectly normal on the shelf and took it home. And um, the mother was no longer living with her husband, uh, this girl's father. And um, the girl looked at the book. Then she came to her mother later that day, pointed to the section on sexual abuse um, and said, that's me. Um, yeah, and the girl um, was only because she had access to the book was she able, first of all, to to sort of put it in the context that a, that a book can provide, you know, and but also then to communicate that very hard message to talk about to her own mother. And this became the basis for a court case, um, you know, in which, um, you know, justice was finally done. But had the book been on a lot, you know, in a lock case, or had it even just put, been put in a place where the girl had to get a note from home, you know, to look at the book, that none of that would have ever happened. Um, a lot of people seem to think that, um, well, if a book is, you know, is, is, is just upsetting in the minds of some members of the community, maybe that's the good solution. You put it in a special place. But when you look at it in real terms, like, you know, what is the psychology for the child? It's, it doesn't really work at all. Yeah. No, that's an incredible story. I mean, I got teary hearing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you also, just to show that this stuff doesn't just happen in the South, um, yeah, one of your first, maybe your first major experiences with um, book banning happened in New York City, didn't it? And with the Board of Education, uh, not oh. the board doing it, but um, people around the board objecting to books, the board, that, that, that the books, that the books had been, that had been selected by the board, including yours. So this happened in the early 90s. It was um, the Rainbow Curriculum was created and the whole purpose of that book was to show diversity uh, because New York City has one of the most diverse uh, school systems in the country. And so it was like the curriculum itself was a 400 page book and there were literally three paragraphs that talked about books with LGBTQ families, uh, Heather has two mommies being one of them, and literally a, a cultural war broke out. And in fact, this was all spearheaded by a woman named Mary Cummings, who was on the school board of District 24 in Queens. And she used the word war. I mean, she was very, very aggressive um, because of her allegations. She, you know, she talked about that these books were teaching children about sodomy. I mean, you know, she was really spreading a lot 
lot of misinformation. And she was very successful, unfortunately, in her campaign to get these books um, taken off the shelves. And the Chancellor of Education, who um, Chancellor Fernandez at the time lost his job over the defense of these books. I mean, it was a really, really awful time. Yeah. And I think that's that's an important point that you just mentioned that's worth underlining that people sometimes lose their jobs because of the um, controversies that develop around a book or a set of books. And we see that a lot around the country, um, librarians and teachers. And everyone I interviewed um, cited the, the library. They're like the foot soldiers, the librarians and the teachers in the in the localities where the challenges take place are the ones who face the wrath of the community um, head on. Yeah, so um, see, I one of the things that I found so hard about making this book was that um, censorship is in some ways so um, hidden. Um, you know, like if it was just a matter of what happens to the author, um, that would be there for everyone to see and to you know be able to understand. But it's all these people, essentially anonymous people who are bearing the brunt of these um, efforts on the part of one person or one group to impose their values on somebody else. Well, it's true because, you know, I, as the author, I might come in and speak to a community and then I leave, but I don't live in that community. And the people who live in that community are the ones that suffer the consequences of um, books not being accessible, of messages that, you know, the reason why we're not having this book is we think it's immoral. And then the book is about a family like yours. I mean, what, what kind of message are you getting when you look around and then you see that your neighbors and educators feel that way about you? Yeah. Very yeah. painful. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Like, how how do these experiences make you as a writer feel? And um, beyond the, sort of the personal aspect of that, um, how does it affect you as a writer, would you say? Well, you know, it, it mostly makes me feel very frustrated. It makes me feel sad for the, the children and the teens who desperately need these books, who need to see themselves depicted in literature so they don't feel alone, so that they feel validated. And it just, it lights a fire under me. I mean, I'm not the kind of person that if you tell me to go away, you know, or to shut up, I'm going to go away quietly. I mean, just the opposite. I'm going to speak louder because I think that's what's really important. Um, yeah. And you know, we were talking a moment ago how about, about how sometimes people lose their job because of these things. And I mean, it seems like, I don't know if you uh, have found this to be true or not, but it seems more often than not, when a book is challenged at a school or library, it ends up staying at that school or library. You know, I think more often than not, challenges are not upheld. And you might, again, as with the Mark Twain example, think, oh, well, so, you know, the system works. But, but there are other consequences. And like it might be that whoever bought that book will think twice the next time a book comes along that might trigger the same, you know, terrible experience. Or it might be that um, the publisher hearing about things like that will think twice about publishing a book that runs, you know, that seems likely to be equally uh, controversial. So um, these challenges have hidden or indirect consequences that can reverberate through time and I think ultimately lead to kind of narrowing of the culture, you know, people acting, uh, taking the side of caution, you know, when, when they have to make a choice of that kind. Well, one thing I think people don't realize is that these kind of challenges actually cost money. So, for example, in Wichita Falls, Texas, the um, the challenge went all the way to um, court, and it cost the city, which was a very small city, a ten thousand dollars at the time in the early nineties, which was a lot of money. And some people thought, you know, the um, man um, who who was challenging the book should have to foot that bill, but of course that's not what happened. So the city had to foot that bill, and that you know that money had to come from somewhere. But and you and you're right. A librarian might just think, you know, next time, well, you know, it wasn't worth it. It's it took a lot of time. It took a lot of energy. It took a lot of money. So I'm I'm just going to not order this book because I I think it might be challenged again, and and I don't want to go through that again. Yeah. So you've used the term sideways aggression to talk about some of the um, forms that uh, censorship can take, and and I know another term which I think is meant to be synonymous with that which is soft censorship and another one of the writers that I interviewed Meg Medina talks about that quite a bit 
Um, could you just say a little bit more about what, what you mean by sideways aggression? Like what some examples maybe from your own experience have been? Gee, I remember we had that conversation and now I am blanking out <laughs> to tell you the truth. Oh, well, I think the example- Prompt, prompt me. <laughs> the, the example of the man who um, try to take all the copies of your book out of the library so it wouldn't be available to anyone might be an example of that. And you said something about someone gluing pages of- Oh yes, yeah. so so many, many, many things happened to Heather. So um, it um, was taken out of the library and returned with all its pages glued shut so that you would think, oh, you know, there's the book in the library, but when you take it home, you literally cannot open it. Um, the book was taken into the bathroom and defecated upon in a, a, a um, library in Ohio, which is kind of awful. Um, you know, people re uh, take the book out and then don't return it, which is really the same thing as stealing it. And then again, you know, I don't know why I'm talking so much about funding uh, this evening, but you know, then it, it costs the library money to replace these books. Well, I mean, I think funding is a big part of the story, really, you know, because if you can make it costly for a library to have a book that some people don't want them to have, you know, maybe they'll just not do it. Um, True. Yeah. Um, so, and then you also gave the example when we talked about, um, you know, being invited to speak at a school, but then at the last minute being given instructions about what you could or could not talk about. Yeah, so that happened, actually it's happened a few times, but this particular time um, I was invited to um, a school in, in Virginia to speak about um, my quote unquote harmless books, my books about animals. And at the last minute, the principal called me into her office, which, you know, just kind of made me have flashbacks to high school and said, you know, um, you are not to mention any of your gay books or something like that. And I it was really... I, First of all, that was not what my programs were about, but you know, if you invite an author to a school, you really can't tell them what to talk about. So I, I said to this principal, um, you can pay me and I can leave, or you can pay me and I can stay and give my presentation, but um, you can't censor me. And you know, that Heather as to mommies isn't on the program, but if I'm asked a question about it, I'm not gonna lie, I will talk about it. And so she thought about it and then she decided that uh, I could give my presentations and she sat in the back and glared at me through five presentations. And what do you know, the last presentation, a little girl raised her hand and she said, you wrote Heather has two mommies. I have two mommies. That's my very favorite book. And she ran to the front of the class and she gave me this big hug. <laughs> and it was just a moment. It was wonderful. Huh. Yeah, another um, great moment that you described for me had to do with a man in one of your audiences who stood up during the question and answer period holding what looked suspiciously like a Bible. And you said that you braced yourself for the worst thinking he had some kind of a rant um, lined up for you, but that isn't what happened. So I wonder if you'd tell us what did happen. So yes, I have had many people in audiences um, stand up and quote scripture to me. And I just really thought this is what was going to happen. But this man's actually said, has anyone ever heard you um, talk about your children's books and change their mind about how they feel about these um, important LGBTQ issues? And I said, gee, not to my knowledge. And then he paused and then he said, well, now one person has. And that was very, very meaningful to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what you hope for, I guess. Um, Absolutely. I don't know and, how often it happens though. What do you think? Well, I'll, I'll just wanted to get, give you another example, which is that I gave a talk about my book, October Morning, a song for Matthew Shepard, uh, which is about the murder of Matthew Shepard and, and which was a hate crime, an anti-gay hate crime. And after, and this was in Kentucky, I heard later about it that a student who was in the audience after my presentation went across the street to the convenience store where another student was working as a, a cashier. And he, he said to him, I just heard this presentation. I'm so very sorry that I called you. And then he said the F word. And he said, and I, I will never call you that again. And they hugged. And I was just amazed. I'm so grateful that somebody actually witnessed this and told me that story. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it just seems like in our society right now, the ability to have those kinds of conversations is what's in short supply, you know. Um, um, would you talk a little bit, Heather has had, has, uh, has, has had more than one um, in, uh, iteration, more than one life. Uh, it's 
had more than one illustrator. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the book has changed over the years and so what I'm your, do you know, what the thinking behind it was? A little show and tell. So here, yeah. there, here are the two versions of Heather as Jamami. This was the first version and this was published in 2015. This was published in December of 1989. So you could see they look very, very different. Um, so um, first of all, I hope that 25 years later, I was a better writer and I, I got to revisit the text and um, shorten it was one thing that I did. And I also, the, to, to me, the, the most important change was in the book, uh, there's a story time and this, the, the teacher reads a story about a book who, about a child who has a dad. And in, in the first version, Heather looks around, thinks, am I the only one here without a daddy? And she begins to cry. And when I thought about this in the second version, I thought, you know, that's really nothing to cry about. It's just, she just wonders about it. So I, I took that out. So that was important to me. Um, in the second version, also the illustrations show a lot more diversity. And also not only in terms of race, but also in terms of family structure, because in the book, the children all draw pictures of their families. And um, one child draws a picture of her two grandparents because that's who's raising her. And I felt that it was very important to represent that. Okay, yeah. Um, did you feel like the world has caught up with you in some ways? Um, I mean, it, do, do, you, do you think Heather is much more of a mainstream book than it was when it was new? Well, you know, it's interesting that you use the word mainstream because one thing that uh, my publisher was Candlewick, uh, who was also the publisher of Leonard's wonderful book, decided to do was, you know, the, the first couple of, of uh, versions of the book, uh, there was a 10 year anniversary edition, there was a 20 year anniversary edition, and they all had notes in the back, you know, a note to parents and, and teachers or a note to educators. And that we realized, you know, we don't have to explain anything. We, you know, we don't have to talk about the book, about controversy, which is, it's just a children's book with, without any notes to adults. So I thought that was really an imp important uh, way to present the book. And I, I think that um, in some ways the world has caught up, um, you know, when Heather was first published, LGBTQ marriage didn't exist, for example, and that's a huge thing, very validating to families, val very validating to kids. But, you know, obviously we, we have a long way to go. Mm, yeah. So when you sort of step back and think about um, people censoring books, challenging books, what do you, you as a writer, you, you know, you're always thinking about the motivation of characters. What do you think motivates those people to do it? Fear. Especially, you know, so many books that are challenged are children's books. And mm -hmm. I think so many people are just afraid that their children are gonna, going to grow up and become adults in a different way than they want. Um, and then they think that they can control who their children are going to become. For example, you know, I was ex had expectations on myself to grow up, to marry a man, a Jewish man, to have children, uh, to have a life very similar to my mom who did not work outside the home. And that was absolutely not anything that I was interested in. And I always tell people that, um, when I was a child, I read, I was a bookworm, most writers are. I literally read thousands of books that depicted straight families, straight couples, and not one of those books changed my sexuality. And I also point out to, to parents, do you care if your child is straight or gay or happy? Right? I, I hope most parents would say happy would be the most important thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I think those are two really good answers to that question. Um, so I want to talk about the power of books. Um, I think everybody who loves books think they have some kind of power, something, um, uh, uh, some ability to change us or to make us uh, have a bigger view of life or a different view of life. And I, I think everyone who challenges books or censors them is also thinking about the power of books and presumably what bad they, things they can do to a child if they get in the wrong hands. So I wonder if you would talk about what, what you think the power books really is and, and what, what is incorrect or misguided about the idea of, of the power books that censors have. So, you know, I don't think a book will change the basic nature of a person. Mm -hmm. However, I do think a book can uh, be validating a book can be comforting. Um, a book can be empowering. So, you know, when I was growing up, I did not come across a book with 
that depicted a Jewish family. And so I always felt different. I always, you know, asked my parents, why can't we have a Christmas tree? Why can't I go to Macy's and sit on Santa's lap? These are things that I saw all around me, even though I grew up in a pretty much almost totally Jewish neighborhood. So, but my direct experience was nothing compared to what I saw in books and in movies and on TV. And so that's what I mean by a book. You know, if I had had one book, which I remember I came upon a book about a Jewish family when I was 27 years old in an independent bookstore. Um, um, it, it was um, The Carp in the Bathtub. And there, I, I had tears streaming down my face because there was a family in a book that looked like mine. And it was just so important to me. So I, I just think that it's, it's, it's just crucial to, I mean, I heard about p uh, kids who take their has two mommies to bed with them and just, you know, they hug it like it's, it's just, it's just so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in a way, the, the flip side of what you, are just talking about uh, is something else that, that we talked about in our interview. Um, you were surprised at first that um, a woman who was not gay could write so um, knowingly about a gay relationship in Brokeback Mountain. And, and you yourself have written a book um, set in Japan. So you were um, venturing beyond your own cultural background. And so I wondering if you would talk a little bit about um, that question of, um, you know, where, what's what's open to writers outside of their own experience or their own cultural background and where if anywhere you would draw a line about that so this is a big topic now in the world of children's literature as you know um i think that it's very important for people to tell their own stories in their own voices i when i wrote hachiko waits uh, which is a historical novel based in japan practically every other paragraph, I thought, am I allowed to do this? Can I do this? And I, you know, I worked really, really hard to get things right. And um, my, uh, I was befriended by a Japanese woman who was in her 80s and grew up at the time of Hachiko. And she just made me feel so welcome. And she, she acted as if I was doing her a favor. And when I presented her with the book, which she had helped me, she was so generous. She said to me with tears in her eyes, you gave me back my childhood. Mm. And that was very validating for me. I mean, I, I think if, if a writer wants to write about an experience other than their own, they just have to do copious amounts of work and homework and checking and having sensitivity readers and, and really working to get it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, we're, I think we're almost at the time when we'll be getting questions from everyone else. And so I was wondering if before we do that, you would want to sort of look a little bit to the future. And I mean, there was a time when Heather was such a cutting edge book. Um, and now, as we were saying before, maybe it's not quite so cutting edge in the sense that the world has changed all around it. Uh, what, what would be the edge for now and for the foreseeable future, either in terms of books you would you hope, want to write or hope to write or would want to see written by other people for children? Uh, well, I think what is really important now is to have more books um, for the trans community. Um, mm -hmm. I know that um, a couple of books, uh, When Aiden Became a Brother is a wonderful book. Um, I think it's, I actually wrote down some titles, uh, She's My Dad. Looks like a very interesting book. I can't speak for it because I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, they shape. I think they, she, he, easy as one, two, three, or something like that. So there's a couple of books coming out about pronouns, which I, I think it's important to give kids tools, right? So that, um, so all of us can work on using pronouns in a respectable way. So I think that um, the trans community is really um, the, the next frontier. And of course, unfortunately, there's been so much violence against the trans community. And I think it's so important to start young and to start educating kids as well as adults that there is diversity in this world and that's what makes this world beautiful and that everyone is deserving of respect and acceptance and celebration. All right. So I wonder, Courtney and Siobhan, uh, do you yeah. want to go to the chat questions? Yes. Leonard and Leslie, I thank you so much for this incredibly important conversation. Uh, I've just loved hearing and reading the, the comments in the chat, and we do have some questions in the Q&A. The first two are, are, I feel, are a little bit linked, so I'll, I'll read them together. Uh, Kara asks, are there, have there been patterns in the ground for challenges? 
And that's the second question, what types of books maybe are most banned? You know, are, are they political? Are they about sexuality? Have you noticed any patterns when it comes to books being challenged? Well, certainly sexuality in books about non-traditional families. Um, some people object to books that have more violence in them than they think children should be exposed to. Um, um, religious issues come up. Um, I mean, the sort of a historical example, but from not from that far in the past, Madeline Lengel's A Wrinkle in Time was criticized both for being too Christian because, um, you know, they're characters who are, the three women are, are guardian angels, so they're sort of supernatural figures, um, too Christian, but also not Christian enough um, because there are passages where, for example, she compares Jesus to, um, to uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So she's putting, you know, this figure from the religious realm on the same level as an earthly, um, you know, creative genius. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, people can, can object to books for reasons that are mutually contradictory. Uh, that can happen. Um, Magic. Oh, yes, right. That's when a big Harry one. Potter, it's a big one. I mean, the Harry Potter books got... Yeah. In fact, and obviously they didn't hurt the sale of Harry Potter, but um, but that doesn't mean that it was a good thing that it happened. Um, and it, it it leads to a kind of arbitrary, um, almost random uh, feeling of um, you know um, we can we can take take down anything we want, <laughs> you know, uh, if we just don't happen to like it. Um, what I'm, I'm missing some of the big categories. What, what am I? Well, missing? of course, LGBTQ books, especially children's books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Um, Thank you. Um, and I mean, I was going to say the, the last really big ca category is is books having to do with with race. Um, and for example, um, Angie Thomas's book, um, The Hate You Give, um, which describes um, killing of a um, unarmed African-American teenage male by, a, by a, a white policeman, you know, and I mean, that's a lot of other things happen in the book, but that's probably this, you'd have to say the central episode of the book. And, um, you know, and that was attacked for being anti-police. And actually, I mean, one of the main sympathetic characters is a policeman. So if you read the book, you've, you can't come to that conclusion, but um, people, very often the people who challenge books don't actually read the books. Um, that's been documented over and over again. So they kind of pluck something out of context. And I think the whole thing about reading is it's all about context, you know, and um, it's how you come to understand a character uh, as you would uh, another person. You, you, you pay attention to all the nuances and to all the contradictions and try to figure out how it all comes together. Um, but in the realm of censors, um, that just doesn't, that's not an issue. So it's kind of um, disappointing. It almost feels like um, people aren't, they would, I don't know, be better educated, you know, be better readers, be more thoughtful people. Maybe they would, wouldn't be so quick to challenge so many books. And Leonard, you mentioned Angie Thomas and the hate you give. She is also one of the authors that you interviewed for You Can't yes. See That. That's right. Yeah. And can you tell us some of the other authors that you interviewed? Um, sure. Well, I mentioned Roby Harris, um, Matt Gilapena, um, <clears throat> Susan Cooklin, who is a journalist and interviewer. Um, her book, um, Beyond Magenta, is a book about transgen uh, transgender teens. Um, she interviewed several of them. And in each case, she you know, was trying to understand um, this important change that was happening in their lives and how they coped with it and how their families uh, understood it. Um, Meg Medina um, and Dave Pilkey and um, R.L. Stein, you know, whose um, Goosebumps books going back to the 90s were among the most frequently challenged books of all time. And those because some people thought they were too scary. Um, I mean, but when you read them, I mean, it's so interesting. Um, there's much about friendship as they are about um, anything scary. And he's very careful about controlling the degree of scare that he um, puts in before the young reader. And um, he even invented a term, which I love. It, he talks about safe scares. And 
like the um, the counterpart in experience outside of reading would be going on a roller coaster. You know, you know you're going to be scared, but you also know it's going to be over in about three minutes, and you're going to be okay. You, you can get back on the street. Um, and his books are crafted in in that same way to limit to allow children to have that experience that a lot of kids actually want, um, but with a frame around it so that it doesn't get out of control. Um, anyway, so um, then also the, the authors of um, uh, and Tango Makes um, Three and David Levithan and Catherine Patterson, who's um, very, you know, be-meddled, um, honored books have also been um, challenged many times, sometimes for what is called coarse language or for um, getting too intense about death, you know, in Bridge to Terabithia for, for some people's um, standards, by some people's standards, and, and on and on. So they're, they're 13 altogether. Great, thank you. Sure. And Leslie, your book, we, one of our questions, Heather has two mommies. Is, is it been out for 30, over almost over 30 years now, correct? It, well, it was first published in 1989. So that would be 32 years. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's incredible. And the question is, do, do you still find, uh, you know, more recent times that that the book is still being challenged and banned? You know, not really. I really haven't heard anything. I mean, what I've, I've heard instead are, you know, these really funny references to it, like on Golden Girls and <laughs> on Will and Grace. And um, at one point, I think John Stewart mentioned, you know, there was that whole uh, thing about um, Girl Scout cookies, Girl Scouts being, you know, witches and lesbians. And John Stewart came up with a cookie. Heather has two Malamars. So there's more been just kind of funny things that have happened, you know, as opposed to real challenges. It's, you know, it's become really a, a cultural um, icon, the book, or at least the title of the book. Well, not everybody can say they created a cultural icon. That's true. Kind of cool. <laughs> it was read on the floor of the Senate, wasn't it? It, it was. It absolutely was. So uh, that that was really quite quite a moment. And uh, this is for you, Leonard. Susanna asks, Leonard, I love the variety of the essays and you can't say that. And wonder about the censorship challenge statistics with regard to challenging images versus challenging text. Oh, gosh. Um... I don't, I don't know, I haven't seen numbers on that. So, I mean, I, I don't know how to, I can't answer the, the question of what the statistics would be. Um, I'm just thinking, um, I mean, in my, from what I know, um, I mean, books tend to be challenged as a whole. Um, and I think more often it's the language which is pointed to, but I mean, there are famous historical examples like In the Night Kitchen by Marie Sendak you know, because the, the naked child, um, Mickey, um, was, the, was the main target for um, the um, um, banning of that book in some libraries in the South. And though you also, I mean, Angie Thomas was one of the people I spoke with who pointed out that she, she didn't necessarily believe that the stated reason that her, books, uh, her, her book was challenged was the real reason. Um, I mean, people would sometimes point to um, the language she used, uh, you know, the four-letter words in her book. They would they would point to that as the reason that the book shouldn't be in a in a child's hands. But the real reason was was the racial, um, you know, conflict that was being described. But people just didn't want to name it, you know. And um, and Meg Medina also talked about um, that issue of, um, you know, she she wrote a book. Um, called um, Yaki Delgado Wants to Kick Your Ass. And it's a book about um, bullying, you know, in junior high school and high school. Um, and um, people, um, you know, don't, some people object to the book because of the title, you know, and they claim that they're concerned about bullying in schools. And yet, as, as Meg said in, in our conversation, but they don't want to actually use the words that that kids used against each other. So how how realistic can any effort on their part be, you know, to address a really serious issue? Um, 
I yeah. think that is one of the world's greatest titles. I mean, as soon as I saw that title, yeah. I was shocked in a good way. Let's say I immediately bought that book and wanted to read it because it is so real. And I know that Meg talks in, in your book, Leonard, about uh, being at a school and being told that she could talk about her book, but not say the title. Mm -hmm. I mean, how in the world can you do that? Right. Yeah. It's, it shows how th this restrictive mentality can you know, become absurd at a certain point. Um, another historical example of illustration being challenged is a book by Garth Williams from 1958 um, called The Rabbit's Wedding, in which he pictured a, a black colored bunny and a white colored bunny um, meeting in this beautiful, you know, woodland um, scene and um, falling in love and, and getting married. And in the South, this book was um, seen as a kind of, um, um, you know, hidden message about um, interracial marriage, you know, so it was, it was removed from the Alabama State Library on that basis. Um, it's unclear what Garth Williams had in mind. I mean, he denied that he was trying to make a political statement, but I wouldn't necessarily take him at his word because, you know, you could see that it could be viewed as, as a provocative book. But, um, but there, um, you know, the illustrations were what um, got that book into trouble. But more often, I think it's the story. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. And this one that I, that I see coming in the Q&A is a perfect one to, to wrap up with. What books do we need more of for children? Huh. Well, I mean, I think Leslie began to answer that question, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, also, you know, one um, issue that I'm very passionate about is oppression around body size. And I think that we need more books that show a diversity of people of all shapes and sizes and not just people who want to change the size of their bodies, but people who are just living in their bodies and don't have a problem no matter what their bodies look like. Yeah. And I mean, David um, Levithan said something on this subject because uh, he's also um, one of the most senior editors at Scholastic, the publishing company, um, that he thinks that di di the concept of diversity needs to become more and more diverse. You know, that's a so, great quote. Yeah, you know, so we're we're our eyes are open. You know, we're thinking about in these terms, but um, I mean, we're all creatures of our time to some extent, and so we're always having to overcome the things we don't notice around us that maybe need change. Great, thank you so much. And I see Sylvie, thank you for sharing in the in the chat. Uh, the recent book, Bodies Are Cool, uh, that, that is just a fantastic book. Um, I'd like to thank you, Leonard and Leslie, for joining us this evening um, for just an incredible conversation. Um, Leonard's book, You Can't Say That, is available in the Carl Bookshop. Uh, thank you to Mike. There it is. We were just commenting before we started. What a fantastic cover <laughs> this, this book is coming out from Candlewick Press. I'd like to thank my colleague, Siobhan McArdle. Uh, she has been, you've been seeing her name pop up in the chat. She's been sharing a variety of links uh, with the group and we'll probably be sharing just one more. And that is um, not only, I think she shared the link to You Can't Say That and how to purchase it from the shop, but also if you're interested in joining us for our next virtual program, it is going to be on August 12th with Grace Lynn and her presentation is called Putting Books to Work. So we hope you can join us for that. Um, this has been recorded. So if you'd like to share it with friends and, and family and colleagues, please uh, check out our Carl Museum YouTube page early next week. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you.